Today's apologists claim the biblical flood is supported by science. I've covered this topic in my Does the Evidence Support Creationism video series, but I think it deserves an update and a more thorough debunking here. This is going to be long for an Atheist Answers video, simply because there is just so much evidence to list. So here we go. Young Earth creationists often claim that the Great Flood mentioned in Genesis occurred over the course of about a year around 4,370 years ago, in 2350 BCE. So-called creation science is about seeking out and reinterpreting scientific evidence to support this belief. Creationists cite such discoveries as fossils found on mountaintops, huge fossil graveyards, fossil footprints that were made underwater, fossil trees spanning multiple geological layers, the folding of geological layers, and so on to support their biblical worldview. Their problem starts with the fact that the researchers who directly study the evidence can demonstrate conclusively that these events and formations occurred over the course of millions to billions of years. And when you test the details of the flood claim against the evidence from history, biology, paleontology, meteorology, geology, and other fields of study, the problems for creationists go from bad to devastating. So keeping in mind the creationist claim of a catastrophic worldwide flood in 2350 BCE, what follows is just some of the problems presented by those scientific fields of study. The mature Harappan civilization existed in India from 2800 BCE to 1900 BCE. The biblical flood supposedly happened in the middle of that period, but the population apparently never noticed it and they left no record of any geological flood. Ironically, there is evidence their civilization ended in part due to a long-term drought. The city of Ur in ancient Sumer, where Abraham was supposedly born, had become a city-state by the 2600s BCE and was continually occupied until 450 BCE. Its historical record is not interrupted by any evidence of a massive flood. The 5th Egyptian dynasty, last ruled by King Unas for up to 30 years, thrived from 2465 BCE until 2325 BCE. There was no interruption to their historical record, nor any mention of a global flood. Instead, it smoothly transitioned into the 6th dynasty. Stonehenge, the Pyramid of Djoser, the Pyramids of Giza, and the Sphinx were built up to hundreds of years before the flood, yet show no evidence of any flood damage at all. According to the Bible, a handful of people somehow used Bronze Age tools to build a wooden ark far larger than the world's largest wooden ship that was built using advanced modern engineering techniques. They then crammed millions of animals onto the ark, along with their many specific dietary and other requirements for a year. That much cargo would have sunk the ship immediately. Because of that problem, most creationists now claim that only representative species from the family taxonomic level were loaded onto the ark, which would have reduced the population to just several thousand individuals. But that only causes another overwhelming problem, explaining how a few thousand species so rapidly evolved into millions of new species within just a few hundred years in order to account for the diversification of animal species seen in preserved remains, artwork, texts, and other historical references. That rate of evolution tremendously exceeds the fastest ever observed, and there are no historical records even mentioning any such observed rapid diversification of species. But the problems only continue to mount. The animals would have had to travel up to thousands of miles to get to the Ark, this includes numerous animals that have limited mobility, or that can only tolerate a narrow range of environmental conditions, or that have highly specialized diets they couldn't bring with them. Examples include termites, snails, sloths, naked mole rats, koalas, and penguins. Just eight people would have had to feed and care for the animals caged on the ark. Even with the benefit of advanced technology and animal care, a modern zoo would require, at a minimum, hundreds of caretakers to handle that many animals. 
And after spending a year in cramped quarters without exercise, those same animals would have had to travel up to 12,000 miles or more across the newly rearranged continents, facing inhospitable terrain and vast oceans to reach their natural habitats. And they would have had nothing to eat, either on their journey or when they arrived, because virtually all their food sources would have been destroyed by the flood. Almost no seeds from land plants can survive immersion in brackish water for a year, so after the flood there would be no way to quickly repopulate the land with plants. Thus there would be little food or habitats to support ecosystems for up to thousands of years. The amount of sedimentation that would need to have been mixed into the floodwaters to account for all the sedimentary layers being laid down at once would have killed virtually all aquatic life, including all the mangroves, seaweed forests, and slow-growing coral reefs that so many marine species can't survive without. And little of any remaining life would have been able to survive the radical changes in water salinity. After the flood, just eight Bronze Age humans would have had to repopulate their former lands across the world, reviving all the lost languages, writing, religions, professions, technologies, and other unique societal developments of their former cultures, without showing any interruption in their historical records, nor mentioning anything about a global flood occurring when it supposedly did. Furthermore, those eight people would have had to reproduce so incredibly rapidly that in just 150 years, around six generations, they would have had enough people to build or rebuild the many cities mentioned in the Bible, as well as repopulate all of Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Indus Valley, China, Africa, the Americas, and so on, with tens of millions of people. All this while experiencing war, disease, and famine during their rapid migration across the entire planet, a migration that isn't even supported by any historical evidence. Even if we ignore all those hardships and use a global growth rate twice as fast as the most rapid growth year ever recorded, 1962, which had the advantage of modern medicine, agriculture, safety technology, etc., that population of eight people would have grown to fewer than 4,000 people in the entire world in those 150 years. Just 4,000 people. That's the population of a small town. It doesn't even come close to the millions of people required to match even the most conservative historical population estimates. The descendants of Noah's family would have all been the products of incest, suffering the genetic risks associated with severe inbreeding. And every human, along with every other surviving species, would have been almost entirely lacking in genetic diversity. But that is the opposite of the wide genetic diversity we see today. It also runs completely counter to the common creationist claims that all genes found in any lineage were present in every original species, and that since then species have only degenerated. These creationists refuse to acknowledge mutation has caused the appearance of new and novel genes, despite genome sequencing revealing the dramatic increase in human genetic diversity over the last 5,000 years. Tree rings are caused by changes in a tree's growth rate over the course of a year. By counting the rings, it's possible to determine the age of a tree to an exact year. The oldest living individual tree found so far is a bristlecone pine in California, with a confirmed minimum age of over 4,855 years old. That's at least 480 years older than when the flood supposedly occurred, an event that would have destroyed the tree. Varves are seasonal deposits of river sediments into lakes. They consist of a light-colored band of coarse, sandy debris deposited during spring and summer runoff, topped by a darker layer of fine clay deposited only after the lake has frozen over in winter when the water moves slowly enough for the clay to gradually settle out. By counting the pairs of banded layers, one can determine the age of the lake. We see lake varves being formed all over the world today, which is how we can confirm how the process works. Numerous locations around the world show ancient lake varves representing hundreds of thousands of years of sedimentation, but Wyoming's Green River Formation varves reveal over 6 million years of sedimentation. For that many varves to have occurred in the one year of the Biblical Flood, 
There would have to have been over 11 varves deposited every minute. Even though each of the fine silt layers needs at least several days to settle out of water. After the flood, the water covering the entire Earth's surface would have had to go somewhere. But there is no mechanism for getting rid of anywhere near that much water. Fossil graveyards have been discovered that contain the fossils of up to 800 billion or more vertebrate species in a single area. Creationists claim this is evidence of a single flood event representative of what happened worldwide. However, if this were true, that would mean there had to have been an average of over 2,000 vertebrate species, ranging in size from tiny shrews to massive dinosaurs, for every acre of land on the planet right before the flood. And that's not even counting the more than 97% of animal species that are not vertebrates. As a general rule, more primitive species are found near the bottom of the fossil record and more advanced species are found higher up. Creationists try to account for this by claiming that more primitive and slower species were less able to escape the floodwaters, while more advanced and mobile species could move to higher ground before the floodwaters caught them. One problem with this claim is that the more advanced flowering plants couldn't move to escape floodwaters any better than the more primitive plants, yet flowering plants are only found much higher up in the fossil record. Also, why didn't even a single one of the fast and agile non-avian dinosaurs make it to higher ground and then die in the same layer as all the slower humans, sloths, and koalas? And how is it that every single human fossil is found only in the uppermost layers, when anyone who had died and was buried before the flood couldn't have possibly climbed to higher ground, on account of being too dead to move, you know? The fact is, except in the case of local flooding, the fossil record is not sorted by flood dynamics. It's sorted by lineages. Whole ecosystems are preserved in each layer, with the most primitive life predominantly found at the bottom and becoming more advanced as you ascend through the fossil record. And the higher up the fossils are, the more closely they resemble currently living species. That is not at all the sorting one would predict from a single catastrophic flood. It is, however, exactly the sorting one would predict if all species evolved over billions of years. Okay, all those facts pose serious problems for creationism, but none of them compare to the heat issues that simply can't be avoided. First, if the rain that caused the flood came from a vapor canopy, it would have had to become superheated on its way down. If the rain came from ice falling from orbit, it would have become superheated upon entering the atmosphere. Add to that the water coming from the fountains of the deep, as the Bible describes it, which from even just a few thousand feet down would be boiling hot, and there's easily enough heat to have vaporized the oceans and destroyed virtually all life on Earth. Creationist scientists who study the vapor canopy issue realize just how big a problem this is. William Warricker of Answers in Genesis has concluded that our appraisal of the biblical and scientific arguments used to support the development of the idea into computationally tractable models of the pre-flood atmosphere has found that the biblical arguments are not compelling. Furthermore, these models fail scientifically mainly because they predict a pre-flood environment which would have been too hot for life except where the canopy water content was far too small to contribute significantly to the floodwaters. That's bad enough. But when we look at the geological consequences, this heat problem gets much, much worse. If plate tectonics moved the continents to their current positions during the flood, as these creationists claim, the energy released by that movement would have boiled the oceans, poisoned the atmosphere through massive volcanic eruptions, and destroyed virtually all life on Earth. More deadly still was the far, far greater heat generated by all the known meteor impacts, hardening of lava, radioactive decay, and limestone formation creationists claim to have also taken place during the flood. That's many times more energy than would be required to reduce the entire crust of the Earth to molten rock. It's the slow release of heat over billions of years that kept the Earth from turning into a huge ball of lava. 
The major creationist organizations even admit that the heat issue is a serious problem for their model. From the Institute of Creation Research, of greater concern to both supporters and skeptics of the RATE project is the issue of how to dispose of the tremendous quantities of heat generated by accelerated decay during the Genesis flood. The amount of heat produced by a decay rate of a million times faster than normal during the year of the flood could potentially vaporize the Earth's oceans, melt the crust, and obliterate the surface of the Earth. But it's highly telling that when faced with the hard evidence, these organizations don't conclude that the flood claim has been falsified, as scientists are supposed to do when faced with such contrary evidence. They instead abandon all scientific credibility by appealing to miracles. For example, AIG's William Warwicker stated, The only real problem is our current lack of understanding of how this was accomplished. The flood account in Genesis 6 through 9 does not tell us directly whether supernatural processes were involved, though it seems very likely that they were. That's not science. That's pseudoscience. You don't cling to a false, predetermined conclusion in the face of conclusive evidence that has falsified your claim. So no, the scientific evidence does not support the biblical flood claim. In fact, the evidence disproves it at every level. The only way to fix the problems is to invoke a miracle at every step in the story, which means giving up all scientific credibility. Creation science that depends on miracles isn't science. It's fantasy.